A blight. How will you end it? Is that all? It is surrounded by an ocean of darkspawn. How will you reach it? If you reach it, how will you slay it? You say you are a Grey Warden. I have heard stories of this order. Great strategists and peerless warriors. That is what we hear of the Wardens. So far, I am not impressed. Will you make that excuse to the Archdemon, or the victims it claims in the meantime? What do you need? Ask away. Same way you did. You drink some blood, you choke on it, and pass out. You haven't forgotten already, have you? Let's see. I was in the Chantry before. I trained for many years to become a Templar, in fact. That's where I learned most of my skills. You're telling me I was banished to the kitchens to scour the pots more times than I can count. And that's a lot. I, I can count pretty high. The Grand Cleric didn't want to let me go. Duncan was forced to conscript me, actually. And was she ever furious when he did? I thought she was going to have us both arrested. I was lucky. I don't know. Maybe. When he came looking for recruits, I just remember praying fervently to the Maker that he would pick me. I'll always be thankful to Duncan for recruiting me. If it hadn't been for him, you know, I would never... I wouldn't have. He was. A good man who didn't deserve his fate. That much I'm sure of. Come on, let's go. I think I'm done talking. What do you need? Ask away. Oh, did I say that? I meant that dogs raised me. Giant slobbering dogs from the Anderfells. A whole pack of them, in fact. Well, if you're going to go and pay attention to the facts, then fine, fine. Let's see, how do I explain this? I'm a bastard. And before you make any smart comments, I mean the fatherless kind. My mother was a serving girl in Redcliffe Castle who died when I was very young. Arleman wasn't my father, but he took me in anyhow and put a roof over my head. He was good to me, and he didn't have to be. I respect the man, and I don't blame him anymore for sending me off to the Chantry once I was old enough. Arleman eventually married a young woman from Orlais which caused all sorts of problems between him and the king because it was so soon after the war. But he loved her. Anyhow, then you, Arlesa, resented the rumors which pegged me as his bastard. They weren't true, but of course they existed. The Arl didn't care, but she did. So off I was packed to the nearest monastery at age 10. Just as well. The Arlesa made sure the castle wasn't a home to me by that point. She despised me. I suppose you're right. I wasn't raised as the Isle's son, though, if you're picturing that. I slept in hay, out in the stables, not on silk sheets. I remember I had an amulet with Andraste's holy symbol on it. The only thing I had of my mother's. I was so furious at being sent away, I tore it off and threw it at the wall and it shattered. Stupid, stupid thing to do. The Isle came by the monastery a few times to see how I was, but I was stubborn. I hated it there, and blamed him for everything. And eventually, he just stopped coming. And raised by dogs. Or I may as well have been, the way I acted. <laughs> yeah, but maybe all young bastards act like that. I don't know. All I know is that the Arl is a good man, and well-loved by the people. He also was King Caelan's uncle, so he has a personal motivation to see Loghain pay for what he did. Anyway, that's really all there is to the story. What do you need? What do you need? Ask away. Have you seen the uniform? It's not only stylish, but well made. 
I'm a sucker for good tailoring. That's just in public. In private, we have these yellow and purple tunics, right? Much more comfortable, and you don't break the beds when you jump on them during a pillow fight. You don't really want to know about my being a Templar, do you? It's really quite boring. Poke, poke, poke. Tell me everything about your life, Alistair. All right, if you insist. It's not like we have anything better to do, right? The truth of the matter is that I did hate going to the monastery. The initiates from poor families thought I put on airs, while the noble ones called me a bastard and ignored me. I felt like Al Eamon had cast me off unwanted, and I was determined to be bitter. But I took some solace in the training itself, I guess. I was actually quite good at it. The education, mostly, but also the discipline. You need to have a disciplined mind in order to use the abilities we have. It was difficult, but rewarding. I never really felt at home anywhere, though, until I joined the Grey Wardens. And Duncan felt my Templar abilities might be useful for when we encountered Darkspawn magic, so I kept it up. What about you? Do you have anywhere you consider home? We won't always be traveling like this, you know. Once the war is over, once the blight is... Well, a time will come when we'll have to think about having a real home again. Though that seems like a far ways off. And I suppose the Grey Wardens are gone for good, either way. I suppose you're right. We can create new Grey Wardens, but we'll never get back those we lost. I wonder if it would ever feel the same. Anyhow, now I've sidetracked us. We'd better get back to what we're supposed to be doing right now. What do you need? Ask away. Such as they are. That's a good question. There's plenty in Orlais, but who knows where they might be found. And the nearest Orlesian city is weeks away. If we go north and cross the sea, there's bound to be some in the free marches. Again, however, I just don't know where. I don't know anything about Grey Wardens in other lands. I imagine that eventually the Grey Wardens outside of Ferelden will wonder what's happened. Why there's no contact from Duncan or someone. They'll send someone eventually. Tell them. Maybe they won't send anyone. We could try to contact them. But that would mean leaving Ferelden, and even if we did, they couldn't come back with us in time to stop the blight. So that means whatever happens, it's up to us. Here in Ferelden, there's our compound in Denerim at the palace, but that's it. Loghain will have control over that and be watching it, no doubt. Beyond that, the only place I know of is Weishaupt Fortress. That's the headquarters of all Grey Wardens in the Anderfels, a thousand miles from here. But I've no idea how to even contact them. So unless we try to get back to the compound in Denerim, I suppose the answer is no. There's nowhere for us to go. I mean, eventually we would have to use the joining to make more Grey Wardens, right? But I don't know how to do the joining. Or what's involved. I know it involves lyrium and some other magic and that it's really difficult to prepare, but that's it. Unless we can find out more about the joining, I guess we better get used to the idea that there might only be two of us for now. Until more come from elsewhere. Just left? You mean just left for Elden? I don't know. If there's an archdemon, however, we're supposed to be the only ones who can defeat it. And that means the Blight would grow unchecked. Eventually, other Grey Wardens in Orlay and other lands would hear about it, and they would come to fight it, but they wouldn't come in time to save Ferelden. There's no way. I'm not going anywhere. About the Grey Wardens, anyhow. Fair enough. What do you need? Ask away. Essentially, they're trained to fight. The Chantry would tell you that the Templars exist simply to defend. But don't let them fool you. They're an army. 
The other main purpose for a Templar is, of course, to hunt mages. To that end, we train in talents that drain mana and disrupt spells. Perhaps, but there usually isn't much of an opportunity. The Chantry keeps a close rein on its Templars. We are given lyrium to help develop our magical talents, you see. Which means we become addicted. And since the Chantry controls the lyrium trade with the dwarves, well, I'm sure you can put two and two together. Well, they do it, and they feel perfectly justified. You don't need lyrium in order to learn the Templar talents. Lyrium just makes Templar's talents more effective, or so I was told. Maybe it doesn't even do that. The Chantry usually doesn't let their Templars get away either, so they can spread their secrets. I'm a bit of an exception. Lucky me. Something on your mind? Something on your mind? Of course. Never, never what? Had a good pair of shoes? Oh, so that's what we're talking about. <laughs> well, if you really want to know, you tell me first. And apparently you have no shame as well. <laughs> well, all right, I'll play along. I myself never had the pleasure. Not that I haven't thought about it, of course. But, you know. Well, living in the Chantry is it's not exactly a life for rambunctious boys. They, they raised me to be a gentleman. That's not so bad, is it? I've uh, no urge to rush into anything. We, we may not even survive what is to come, after all. Enough. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Let's go. Something on your mind? Of course. You mean other than becoming a Grey Warden? Hmm. You know, I asked Duncan this too, and all I got was, you'll see. Oh, it's not that Duncan wants to keep it a secret, it's just that the Grey Wardens don't discuss it much. I gather it's not a pleasant topic. The first change I noticed was an increase in appetite. I used to get up in the middle of the night and raid the castle larder. I thought I was starving. I'd slurp down every dinner like it was my last, <laughs> my face all covered in gravy. When I'd look up, the other Grey Wardens would stare, then laugh themselves to tears. Really? I saw you eating dinner the other day. Savage. I guess it affects people differently, regardless of the cause. You're still a savage. <laughs> oh, and then there were the nightmares. Duncan said it was part of how we sense the Darkspawn. We tap into their, well, I don't know what you'd call it, their group mind. And when we sleep, it's even worse. You learn to block it out after a while, but at first it's hard. It's supposed to be worse for those who join during a blight. How is it for you? Some people never have much trouble, but that's rare. Others have trouble sleeping their entire life. They're just more sensitive, I suppose. Everyone ends up the same, though. Once you reach a certain age, the real nightmares come. That's how a Grey Warden knows his time has come. Oh, that's right. We never had time to tell you that part, did we? Well, in addition to all the other wonderful things about being a Grey Warden, you don't need to worry about dying from old age. You've got 30 years to live. Give or take. The taint. It's a death sentence. Ultimately, your body won't be able to take it. When the time comes, most Grey Wardens go to Orzammar and die in battle rather than waiting. It's tradition. You'll always find Darkspawn down where the Dwarves are. The oldest Grey Wardens head to the Deep Roads for one last glorious battle. Not that there's a shortage of Darkspawn during a Blight, but that's the tradition. The Dwarves respect us for it. 
And you wondered why we kept the joining a secret from the new recruits. Well, there you have it. You know, Duncan... He started having nightmares again. He told me that in private. He said it wouldn't be long before he'd go to Orzammar himself. I guess he got what he wanted. I just wish it had been something worthy of him. I know. Ending the blight should make this all worthwhile, right? Something on your mind? Of course. I didn't know them for very long, but I guess it was longer than you. You never met them all, did you? They were quite a group. Actually, they felt like an extended family, since we were all cut off from our former lives. We also laughed more than you think. There was this one time... Well, you probably don't want to hear stories about men you didn't know. There was one Grey Warden who came all the way from the Anderfels. What was his name? Gregor. Gregor. He was a burly man with the biggest, fuzziest beard you've ever seen. And the man could drink. He drank all the time, but he never got drunk. Finally, we all made a pool to see just how many pints it would take to put him under the table. Sometimes, we were kin of a sort. All of us had gone through the joining, so we knew... Well, anyhow, it doesn't have to be deadly serious all the time. Anyhow, we never did find out. He said he'd drink a pint for every half pint that the rest of us drank. He was still going by the time the rest of us were passed out. <laughs> I'm told that Duncan walked in later on and saw us all passed out from one end of the hall to the other, and Gregor still drinking. <laughs> Duncan laughed until he nearly... until... Yes, I... I suppose so. I thought I was done with this, but it just struck me that I have nothing to remember Duncan by. Nothing at all. There's no body, not even a token of his that I could take with me. That must sound really stupid to you. I just would have liked something of his to take with me, that's all. Well, there's no use in moaning about it, is there? He's gone. Let's just go. I'm wondering something. I'd like to know your thoughts about some of our traveling companions. Do you mind if I ask? What about Sten? The way he looks at me with those eyes. Creepy. And he's so quiet for someone so big. Yet he doesn't seem quite so bad as the Chantry tells us. According to them, his philosophy is vile and evil. Yet he seems so reasonable. And yet, he killed all those people. He doesn't even deny it. Doesn't that bother you? Hmm. I'm not so sure that his regret means the same as it would for us. The Kunari sense of honor is... is a bit hard to grasp. For me, anyway. What about Liliana? Is she crazy? Or do you really believe in her vision? That's one way to put it. I don't know what to make of her. If you look at her when she doesn't see you, she just looks so... so sad. I almost feel guilty taking her away from her life. Yes, I know. Still, I feel badly for her. Morrigan, do you trust her? Think about it. Maybe Flemeth sent her with us for some other reason than she said. Well, aside from the fact that she's a complete and utter bitch, no, I don't like her at all. Why, do you? Sure. Beautiful, just like... Like something that's also dangerous, like a beautiful, dangerous thing. Yes, one of those, but more evil. <laughs> Enough. I think my curiosity is sated. 
Let's get back to it, shall we? Something on your mind? Of course. What do you wish of me? If you must. Why do you ask me such questions? I do not probe you for pointless information, do I? Beg pardon, then, while I jump for joy. What is it you asked if I grew up in the wilds? A curious question. Where else would you picture me? For many years it was simply Flemeth and I. The wilds and its creatures were more real to me than Flemeth's tales of the world of man. In time, I grew curious. I left the wilds to explore what lay beyond, never for long. Brief forays into a civilized wilderness. For the most part, Flemeth taught me well. For all that I had been taught, however, the truth of the civilized lands proved to be... overwhelming. I was unfamiliar with so much. So confident and bold was I, yet there was much that Flemeth could never have prepared me for. <laughs> Equal parts daring and foolhardy, perhaps. Only once was I accused of being a witch of the wilds, and that by a chastened who happened to be traveling with a merchant caravan. He pointed and gasped, and began shouting in his strange language, and most assumed he was casting some curse upon me. I acted the terrified girl, and naturally, he was arrested. Men are always willing to believe two things about a woman. One, that she is weak, and two, that she finds him attractive. I played the weakling and battered my eyelashes at the captain of the guard. <laughs> Child's play. The point being that I was able to move through human lands fairly easily. Whatever humans think a witch of the wild looks like, tis not I. Not that I did not have trouble. There are things about human society which have always puzzled me, such as the touching. Why all the touching for a simple greeting? Yes, yes, some men have painted lines across the maps. I've seen them. I'm sure the human world is very diverse, but the differences are mostly meaningless. There were many nuances that Flemeth could never tell me of. When to look into another's eyes, how to eat at a table, how to bargain without offending, none of these things I knew. I still do not understand it all, truth be told, but then I gave up long ago any hope of doing so. When I returned to the wilds last, I swore to Flemeth that I had no intention of leaving again. Yes, here I am. Well, let's get on with it before the ground opens up and swallows us, yes? I have a thought. We have an opportunity that I believe we should take advantage of. To the point. My mother was once divested of a particular grimoire by a most annoying Templar hunter. It occurred long before I was born, but even today, Flemeth speaks of the loss with great rage. With the circle of magi in such disarray, it occurs to me that this might be the perfect time to recover the tome from their possession, for surely it eventually ended up in their hands? Flemeth is a sorceress of legend, is she not? And her grimoire would be more than a mere curiosity to mages that daren't even glance towards the places my mother has walked for eons. No doubt tis considered something dangerous, perhaps best locked away somewhere dark, yes? And if not, then at least I know it does not exist. But there is no harm in looking, surely? Tis a book of spells, of the sort that Flemeth has dabbled with throughout her long life. Tis not the sort of thing that would benefit a mage of the standard variety. They were taught a different path. I, however, was taught by my mother. I know a way around the wards my mother would have placed on such a tome. I know the language that she would have written it in. I would find such a tome most useful.
Useful in the way that it might increase my power. Useful in the way that I would become more useful to you. Does that not follow? Good. I am most interested to see its contents, should it be located. The grimoire is leather-bound and adorned with the symbol of a leafless tree, should you come across it. If not, however, then I shall simply put it out of my mind. Yes? At times, perhaps. A world full of people and buildings and things was all very foreign to me. If I wished companionship, I ran with the wolves and flew with the birds. If I spoke, it was to the trees. Such simple pleasures will only enthrall for so long. I recall the first time I crept beyond the edge of the wilds. I did so in animal form, remaining in the shadows and watching these strange townsfolk from afar. I happened upon a noblewoman by her carriage, adorned in sparkling garments the likes of which I had never before seen. I was dazzled. This, to me, seemed what true wealth and beauty must be. I snuck up behind her and stole a hand mirror from the carriage. It was encrusted in gold and crystalline gemstones and I hugged it to my chest with delight as I sped back to the wilds. Flemeth was furious with me. I was a child and had not yet come into my full power and I had risked discovery for the sake of a pretty bauble. To teach me a lesson, Flemeth took the mirror and smashed it upon the ground. I was heartbroken. Beauty and love are fleeting and have no meaning. Survival has meaning. Power has meaning. Without those lessons, I would not be here today, as difficult as they might have been. Do I not? I am still an apostate mage, even if I have left the wilds. The Darkspawn are yet undefeated. No, there is much that remains. To return to your original question, perhaps my time in the wilds was indeed lonely, but such was how it had to be. I find myself at times wondering what might have become of the girl with the beautiful golden mirror, but such fantasies have no place amidst reality. Yes? We are in camp, so tis as good a time as any. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you are very cute to ask so many questions. Really? Perhaps we should be wrapped in ribbons and adorned with flowers. So cute are we, too. <laughs> My mother has been hunted from time to time, yes by Templar fools like Alistair, which should tell you how successful they generally were. Flemeth made a bit of a game of it, in fact. The Templars would come again, and she would look at me and smile and say that the fun was to begin once more. I am unsure. I was too young to understand, and perhaps it was bravado on Flemeth's part, or perhaps she was merely amused. I will never know. Flemeth would warn them once. It was a warning they inevitably failed to heed. And then the true game began. Often Flemeth would use me as bait, <laughs> a little girl to scream and run and lure the Templars deeper into the wilds and to their doom. Sometimes, eventually. Thankfully, the wilds is a vast place. Once they found us, Flemeth would simply move us elsewhere and we would be lost within the forest once again. I did not understand the danger we faced until I was much older. I had never heard of apostates or maleficarum. You do not know. The zealots use that word for any magic they do not control. 
The Chantry sees any mages not leashed to the Circle of Magi as apostates, and apostates could become Maleficarum, evil mages that resort to blood magic and become demon-enslaved abominations. It may even be true. Still, those of us who prefer freedom see no reason to submit. Oh, I hope you're not simply being agreeable. It would be a refreshing change. Enough of this talk. Let us return to the task at hand. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> well, that depends, does it not? What does she seem to be? You mean, is she truly the Flemeth of legend and story? Tell me, how much do you know of the tale? The one that the Chastened still tell of my mother, to frighten them into obedience? I can relay what Flemeth once told me herself, and you can decide whether or not tis the truth, if you desire. As the tale is sung by the bards, there was a time when Flemeth was young and beautiful, a fair lass in a land of barbarian men, the desire of any who saw her. The tales say that Flemeth fell in love with Osin the Bard, and fled the castle of her husband, the dread Lord Conobar, and that he swore vengeance for her infidelity, in truth. My mother claims that t'was Osen who was her husband, and Conobar the jealous lord who looked on from afar. Lord Conobar approached young Osen and offered him wealth and power in exchange for his lovely wife, and Osen agreed. The life of a bard is a poor one, and love fades in the wake of hunger. It was Flemeth who suggested the arrangement. All would have been well had Lord Conobar kept his end of the bargain. But he was a foul man who bargained with coin he did not possess. Osen was led off to a field and slain, left for dead. Flemeth spoke to the spirits and learned of the deed, and swore revenge. Spirits first, and twas they who slew Conobar. Flemeth did not turn to the demon until... much later. Lord Conobar's allies chased Flemeth, you see. Chased her to the wilds, and there she hid. There she found the demon, and he made her strong. The legends all speak of the great hero Cormac, he who defeated Flemeth and her great army when she invaded the lowlands centuries later. All lies. The truth of the matter is that there was never an invasion. As Flemeth tells it, the Chastened never raised an army under her banner, and she never fought with any warrior named Cormac. Cormac led a brutal civil war against his own people, and later claimed it was to vanquish evil that had taken root amongst the Lords. Thus, he was hailed a hero. Flemeth was only attached to the legend much later. Perhaps it was due to the great war with the Chastened that eventually came, but Mother claims not to know how it began. The demon within her has transformed her into... something else. An abomination, perhaps, some would say. I know not. I only know my mother is clever, and she is part of the wilds as it is part of her. But she is no immortal. She bleeds. A blade in her heart would kill her like any other, were it lucky enough to find her. I do not believe everything that Flemeth claims. Oft it seems her bitterness has colored her memories. But on the whole, yes, I believe this tale, if not all. You ask if I have sisters. I have asked of this myself. The stories tell of many witches of the wilds, after all, not just the one. And these tales existed long before I did. Flemeth refuses to speak of other daughters, if they existed. So, should I believe I am her first? 
I doubt that too. The Chastened tell of a falling out between Flemeth and her daughters. They say that one day she hunted them all through the wilds and ate their hearts. It may be true. I have never seen another witch or heard of one. Perhaps one day Flemeth will eat my heart as well. Flemeth tells it with far more embellishment than I, but you are welcome. Dare I ask of your own mother? Few are abominations of legend, tis true, but I find myself curious nevertheless. I... nothing. I wish to know nothing more. I find myself a little envious, to tell the truth. But it matters not. Let us move on. Yes? So, full of questions, are you? <laughs> I assume you were actually asking whether Flemeth herself gave birth to me. Truly, I do not know. I once asked Flemeth that very question and she merely laughed at me. It is not inconceivable that she could capture a chastened man, or perhaps change to a more attractive form to attract him willingly. I find it more difficult to imagine her with child. As a matter of fact, I remember her being younger once. She had black hair, much like my own, long and lustrous. But how could that be if she is centuries old? Has she become wizened only recently? Or are the tales of her legend only that and nothing more? I do know the tales of Flemeth having many daughters, even though I have never met another, and Flemeth has always treated me as her blood. <laughs> what an odd thing to say! Why must love enter into the equation? Flemeth taught me everything I needed to learn. How to survive, the meaning of power, the truth of men. If other mothers do not teach these things, then I believe them the lesser. I shall take this as a compliment. Was it meant as such? Oh? How interesting. You agree that love is a weakness, then? Take yourself. You do not honestly desire such things from me, do you? It is better to be free of such cloying and cluttering delusions as love. Then more the fool you, I think. I tire of this discussion. Let us move on, shall we? Yes? So... Full of questions, are you? <laughs> oh, it's been a long day. Rest, rest would be welcome. Yes, yes, of course. I am just a little weary. As you may have noticed, I'm no spring chicken. Thank you. You're very kind to say so. But in all honesty, I do not know how many years I have left in me. I have lived for such a long time. But there is always something else to do. And I have to keep going in order to do it. I think I will be glad when I am done. Oh, I don't know. I really don't. Have you encountered many abominations, apart from the ones in the Circle Tower? The first time I saw an abomination, my blood turned to ice. It was months before the nightmares stopped. It was the knowledge that I could easily become one of them that frightened me the most. Every mage is vulnerable, no matter how accomplished or powerful. That is the first thing we learn, and overconfidence can lead to recklessness. One slip, 
All it takes is one slip, and everything you are is simply gone. Replaced by madness. And there is no turning back. Or at least that's what they say. Of late, I have begun to wonder if... If there is any way an abomination can be... Cured. Or if a mage could be so possessed and still retain their sanity. Their... Humanity. Yes. It is madness and cruelty that define abominations. If those are lacking, if the mage remembers the person they truly are, then they are not an abomination. I never saw that. Thank you for showing me another way of looking at it. So, tell me, how did you become a Grey Warden? Ah, you are keeping this tale to yourself, I see. Fair enough. Forgive me for prying. I am interested to hear. Arl Rendon Howe? The Arl of Amaranthine? Why would he do such a thing to you? You are... You are the last of the Kuslans? I had no idea. My lord... Yes, I suppose so. You can no longer have a title, can you? But that does not mean you must forget utterly where you came from. Take heart, dear friend. You survived, even when you were not expected to. We do not know yet what lies in store for you, or the name you carry. It is not so bad, is it, being a Grey Warden? Sometimes it gives me comfort to think that everything will end up the way it's supposed to. That it will be all right. You were chosen. You survived the joining when others did not. Perhaps it was meant to be. I must ask, what does being a Grey Warden mean to you? There's that, of course. But there's more to being a Grey Warden than killing Darkspawn and saving the world from the Blight. Ultimately, being a Grey Warden is about serving others. About serving all people, whether elves or dwarves or men. As a Grey Warden, you are a guardian of men. And you guard them because their continued existence is more important than you are. Thus it is you who serves, not they. Oh, but you are. Your king serves you, does he not? A good king. A true king who cares for his land. Uses his power to rule firmly but fairly. He serves his people first and foremost. The king who does not do this, who believes that he is entitled to his power, who abuses it, and uses it for his own means, is a tyrant. But we are not talking about how you came by the power, but what you do with it afterwards. If you live apart from others, and your actions affect only you, then you may do as you wish. But if you have power, influence, and strength, your every action will be as a drop of water in a clear, still pond. The drop causes ripples, and ripples spread. Think of how far they will go, how wide they will become, how will they affect the pond. But I've lectured enough for today. I should stop before I wear out my welcome. What's on your mind? Oh, yes, and thank you for asking. I'm feeling much better today. I suppose I must be. What's on your mind? I will answer to the best of my ability. 
The circle is in good hands. Irving knows what to do, and he doesn't need me underfoot. For now, I will support those that battle the Darkspawn. I do feel I left things unfinished in Ostagar. There is so much left to do, and I would be part of it. The Grey Wardens, all two of you, need all the help you can get. I will see this through to the bitter end, and after that, if I am still left standing, then I will return to the Circle. Perhaps. What's on your mind? I will answer to the best of my ability. People don't become mages. They are born mages. The talent just surfaces later. But you are asking how I ended up at the Circle. I was brought there by the Templars, just like many of the other apprentices. I don't remember very much. I was very young then. I didn't have a family. I never knew my real parents. My earliest memory was of hiding in a hayloft on a farm, trying to keep warm. I was found, and the farmer's wife was kind enough not to send me away. But they had children of their own, and I was never made to feel welcome. The eldest son was the worst. He was always calling me a stray, and throwing anything he could get his hands on at me. And I don't know how it happened, but one day, he just found his hair on fire. Fortunately, there was a large trough nearby. He ran screaming, dripping head and all, to his mother. I was shut up in the barn, with a bowl of water and a crust of hard bread. The Templars arrived several mornings later. I'll never forget the moment the Templars led me into the entrance hall of the tower. I had never seen anything so grand in my life. I stopped being afraid then. I knew I was home. Well, that's about all there is to my tale. That's how I came to the Circle. I would be lying if I said it was easy. First, there were rules, and we were constantly watched to make sure we behaved appropriately. Then there was the study of magic. We had to cast the spells just so, control the effects completely. A single word spoken incorrectly, a gesture out of sync, and lack of focus. And we needed to have perfect focus, or we would be in danger. From fade spirits, if we were careless, they would enter our minds and we would become abominations. Without the Circle and my mentors, I would not have been where I am today. And there was joy in life at the Circle. The joys of fellowship, in knowing that you were not alone in your struggles. In spite of everything, I was happy in the Tower, and I loved it. <laughs> 